When we start reading Mark chapter 16, we ought to know pretty quickly we're in for a puzzle. It's all very dark and mysterious. The Sabbath was over and the women came to the tomb, um, but they didn't know what they were going to do. And then when they came to the tomb, they discovered that the stone had been rolled away and there was an angel inside who said something very strange to them. And then Mark says they went out and fled from the tomb. Trembling and panic had seized them and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that is where the story breaks off. And we want to say, uh, excuse me, what happened next? And part of the point, I think, is that Easter is meant to be not a quiet, happy ending at the end of this very odd story, but precisely something new, something scary, something dark and mysterious. And unless we feel Easter like that, we're not really reading Mark for all he's worth. Now, I should say that I think Mark's gospel was broken off at that point, not because that's where Mark intended to finish it, but because perhaps the very first manuscript got torn off at that point. If you go to museums where they have copies of old scrolls, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance, or if you look at first century books where they stitched leaves together, it's the beginning ones and the end ones, or the beginning and end of the scroll, that often did get torn off. And like many other scholars, I actually think that's what happened to Mark. Mark. But in the strange providence of God, this may be a good thing because Mark needs to tell us that Easter is dark and mysterious and scary. It's not just all fluffy Easter bunnies and nice sunshine and daffodils and so on. It's much stranger than that and we need to be prepared to allow that strangeness to enter our imaginations and help us to see something has happened which means that a new world is opening up and those women at that tomb had no idea where this was going to take them. And that's a very good lesson for us to learn because if we take Easter seriously, the point is not that we now know what it all means and everything is going to be easy and plain sailing from here on. Part of the point is that we don't know what it all means and we ought to think, oh my goodness, I don't know what to say. I'm afraid of what God is now going to do in this wonderful new world which is opening up in front of us. But for us, as we look at the story, then things start to become clear. And as we read back in Mark's Gospel, we find Jesus in chapter 8 and in chapter 9 saying not only will the Son of Man be crucified, but he will be raised on the third day, and that this will be the fulfillment of his whole kingdom purpose, his whole agenda. The thing is, that everybody in the first century knew a crucified Messiah was a failed Messiah. Jesus' first followers weren't sitting around on Holy Saturday saying, oh, well, that was very unpleasant yesterday, but never mind, because in a day or two he'll be back. They had no idea that that was going to happen. For them, Jesus' words about resurrection were a very strange thing that they couldn't understand. For them, resurrection was something that was going to happen to all God's people at the end of time, not something that would happen to one person in the middle of history. What could Jesus have been talking about? They weren't ready for what happened. But then as they came to terms with it, they realized that actually Jesus' crucifixion was not a failure, was not a defeat. This was a victory, a victory over the dark power that came to be called collectively sin or Satan or whatever. And that Easter therefore meant that a whole new world, a new life, a new creation was opening up. And that they had to be not only people who would benefit from it, but people who would actually make it happen in the power of God. The kingdom really is launched. The forces of evil, ultimately death itself, have been defeated. That's why it's scary. We don't know where we're going in this new world. We have to go there with Jesus and at his command. This means that Jesus is not only the Messiah that they were waiting for, Israel's true anointed king. This means, and it took them some while to come to terms with this, he really is Israel's God in person. Already in Mark's gospel we can see from the beginning right the way through this strange belief that Israel's God who had promised to come back and live with his people had come back not as a cloudy presence like in Isaiah's vision in the temple, not as whirling wheels like Ezekiel's vision at the beginning of his prophecy, but in and as a human being, Jesus of Nazareth. And they grasped for the categories which the Old Testament gave them of God the Father and God the Son. 
you are my son, this day have I begotten you. Mark quotes that at the beginning of his gospel and now we see what that means. Jesus is the one who embodies and expresses the Father's will and purpose. And this means particularly, as we read excitedly back through Mark, thinking, suppose this is all true, what do we now do about it? It means that some of that element of new creation can come into its own. Think of Mark chapter 7, where Jesus warns that cleanness and uncleanness aren't really a matter of whether you wash your hands or not, or whether you're eating the right sort of food or not, that cleanness or uncleanness is about the heart now, Jesus doesn't actually say it in so many words in Mark chapter 7, but it really does look as though what he's saying is that real cleanness is what happens inside you. But is he just saying that to tantalize them, to tease them, to say, well, um, it would be nice if you could get there, but we know you can't. No, it looks as though Jesus is offering a cure for uncleanness of heart. And at Easter, we see why Jesus has defeated the, the powers of sin and death themselves. And if he can do that cosmically, he can do it for you and me. And then in chapter 10, when he's talking about marriage, and they say to him, well, Moses gave us the command that if it didn't work out, we could just divorce our wives. It was men divorcing women usually in those days. And Jesus says, ah, Moses gave you that command because of the hardness of your heart. But from the beginning, it wasn't so. What is he saying? Is he being cruel and saying, well, you may be hard-hearted, but I'm not going to let you go that route? No, he's saying that somehow, strangely, God has a cure for hardness of heart. Oh, it may be difficult to find. There may be pain and grief and tears before the hardness and uncleanness of our hearts can be washed through and softened out. But God can do it and God wants to do it. And in the power of Easter, God will do it if we will let him. So it means that God's project for us personally has got off the ground as well as cosmically. But it also means that the kingdom which Jesus has been, in his own illustration, sowing like a farmer sowing seed in a field, that kingdom is going to grow. Those parables of the kingdom back in Mark chapter 4 are full of the idea of new life. And indeed, in the prophetic literature of Israel, again and again, the idea of farmers sowing seed was a picture of what God would do at the time when he restored the fortunes of his people. You know the stories in Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower. A lot of the seed seems to go to waste and so on, but some of it will bear fruit, 34. 60-fold, 100-fold. That is a resurrection promise. And with that resurrection goes the promise that when we decide in the power of the Spirit and in penitence and faith that we are part of this team, we want to be kingdom people with and for Jesus our risen Lord, then what happens is that what we do, even the little things that we do down the street to help somebody or whatever it is, can bear fruit in ways that we would never imagine. That's part of what reading Mark at Easter time is supposed to do to us, to make us realize that we are called to be resurrection people, surprised, maybe frightened, quite possibly, but kingdom bearers, kingdom growers, people who, following Jesus, learning from him, are able to bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. And at the very center of Mark's gospel, just after Peter's confession of him as Messiah, just after Jesus' warning that he has to go to the cross, we find the scene which sums so much of this up. Jesus takes three of his followers up the mountain, and there with Moses and Elijah, he is transfigured. On a clear day, it seems, you can see forever. And suddenly the whole picture, Old and New Testaments, comes rushing together in a blaze of light. We need to pray as we read Mark at Easter time that something of that light will fall upon the page, will fall upon our hearts, and will shine out through what we do as Easter people into the world that needs it so badly.